this uh, player and I have been playing tennis on uh, a clay court. Uh, you know, the surface uh, makes all the difference. Uh, I have been uh, teaching all these uh, 35 to 37 years in real uh, speech uh, situations, in real life speech situations. Now, it's uh, sort of difficult for us old people, unlike you, many of you young people, unlike you young people, to get acclimated to this uh, new medium. And in our case, I think the medium is uh, more uh, a hindrance than help. I think in real life speech situation, this seminar might uh, be more meaningful. And uh, I think I might uh, be doing a much better job. Anyway, <clears throat> another consideration which kind of uh, <clears throat> deters me is uh, the composite uh, uh, nature of the audience or uh, different groups of people in the audience and uh, one has to uh, take chances pitching one's presentation at a certain level and maybe i should make sure that i, I pitch at a certain level at which i would be able to make myself accessible intelligible to everyone and also useful at the same time. So that is the second consideration. Anyway, <clears throat> I think in the course of uh, this new normal uh, period, uh, we will all get used uh, more and more. Certainly, I have to get used more and more, uh, as the structuralist puts, puts it, <coughs> get naturalized to this uh, medium. <clears throat> as one gets naturalized uh, to one's uh, language, well, be it one's own native uh, language or uh, another language which one is trying to acquire in a social, social cultural context. Now, <clears throat> the topic, uh, thank you, before I go on with my topic, I think I should uh, say that Professor Murali Ghanam Professor of uh, Music and Musicology. He should have been a professor of music and musicology. <laughs> He's a professor of English. He, he filled his uh, <clears throat> introduction and welcome note with a lot of nice things about me, and I thank him for all that. I consider myself only <clears throat> a student, uh, a scholar in the making, even uh, as, you uh, know, uh, <clears throat> The scholar is an archetypal figure, uh, a seeker for knowledge, a seeker for uh, uh, verity and beauty and whatnot, uh, all the great uh, values. So we are all students. That was why I wanted to uh, use the word study as uh, one of the three key terms in my uh, caption. So the caption is dimensions of literary studies. So one who under, undertakes a study is a student. If you look up the etymology of student and study, you find a very interesting thing <clears throat> that will put you in the company of Will, William Hazlitt, who is usually described as the critic of gastro. A student is one who is full of gastro, is full of enthusiasm. So student comes from the root, the Latin root, studere, studere is to study. To study in the Latin sense is to be zealous, z-e-a-l-o-e-s, zealous, not jealous, but zealous. Zealous, uh, that is to be enthusiastic. A student is therefore an enthusiast about what he is about. A student is enthusiastic about knowledge, episteme, connaissance, savoir, what have you, sophia, whatever uh, term in Greek or uh, Latin you might think of as some kind of equivalent to knowledge. So a student is one who is full of enthusiasm. In that sense, a study should be 
full of uh, enthusiasm. It can never be a bored and a boring study. Study by definition and a student by definition has got to be high spirited, has got to be full of enthusiasm and uh, excitement. <clears throat> Now, the second key term in my caption is uh, literary. Once again, look up the etymology. <clears throat> literary comes from the Latin litera, L-I-T-T-E-R-A, litera, which means letters. Now, the dictionary will give you a number of meanings. The first uh, meaning, perhaps, the literal meaning of litera, literary would be connected with litera, that is letters, that's the alphabet. The first meaning is alphabet. The second meaning is letters, letters in the sense of epistles, epistles, letters, letter correspondence in that sense, letter. The third meaning is any written composition, not only letters, epistles, but any written composition, any written work that is literature. And the fourth meaning, of course, literature of value, literature which is of a qualitative order, which is characterized by certain values and literature of excellence, literature of sublimity, and literature which is admirable as literature, <clears throat> not only as literature, but also uh, for extra literary considerations. So there are at least three to four meanings embedded in this word if you look up the etymology and usage. Now, I feel literature is not really the term which would be preferred by post-structuralists and post-modernists because they don't want to have any differentiation between literature as we understand, as humanists under, understands it, and literature as they understand it. Literature for them might be <clears throat> full of ideology and therefore a repressive instrument, a repressive mechanism. So they go in for terms such as a creature, writing, and so on, text, discourse, and so on. But I, as a humanist, a humanist who has uh, <clears throat> kind of Worked my, my worked my way through through post structuralism, structuralism, post structuralism, and what have you, all kinds of uh, methodologies, all kinds of systems, and so on. As a person who has worked uh, one's way through all these systems and come out uh, of these systems, I I still have what you might call a critical humanism, a kind of humanism which could survive post-structuralist scathing attack or critique. So, as a critical humanist, I wanted to bring in the term literary and literature as part of my caption. And of course, the first term is a dimension, dimensions of literary studies. So I did choose each one of these three terms with certain considerations in view. I told you about the considerations which made me choose study and student and so on. And then and the considerations which motivated me to choose literary. Now the considerations which have motivated me to choose a term such as dimensions. Now immediately you know that dimension could be used as a commonsensical term and also as a technical term, as a term in physics. Now, you may take it <coughs> as a commonsensical term or even as a technical term. And I'm not going to deal with the dimensions of the technical uh, physicist uh, signification so much now, but I would like to make use of one or two shades of meaning relating to physics with regard to this term dimension. Now let us go to the etymology first. Now this is one of the things that one learns from 
philological critics and there's a lot of philology philological tradition in post structuralism there's a lot of philology in freud there's a lot of philological tradition in post structuralism particularly in derrida etymology and comparative philology can always equip you with certain <clears throat> conceptual <clears throat> prehistory and therefore this is one of the textual operations one of the netic n o e t i c netic relating to consciousness psychic operations that you could take over that could, that you could learn from the philological critics and also post structures so if you have learned any system of theory or any system of criticism i think you should be able to take over some of their strategies some of their textual operations and the etymology philology is a strategy which i have <clears throat> found in super brilliance in post structure particularly derrida and i would like to exploit it for my own purposes so let us uh, start with the etymology of dimension it comes from a latin uh, expression the latin expression has got the prefix di di and uh, the base of the root metiri m e t i r i metiri so di di that is the prefix metiri di means doesn't mean <clears throat> two things here it doesn't mean that di here means apart apart so di is apart metiri is to measure measure now measure <clears throat> is connected with the greek word latin has taken it from um, <clears throat> from the greek word metron metron so that is a kind of greco latin network at work there so what you can measure apart is what is called a dimension what is measurable apart is what is called a dimension but uh, you will find that once you start measuring a dimension one particular dimension you are caught up in another dimension or maybe in more than one dimension in other words you can never have a dimension apart from another dimension or other dimensions so i wanted to suggest the interlink between one way of looking at uh, literary studies or literature and literary studies literature is one thing studies is another thing there is a distinction there but uh, <clears throat> i am uh, talking more about literary studies than about literature so the critical approaches the theoretical approaches uh, theoretical critical approaches or critical theoretical approaches all these are dimensions and each of literary studies and each one of these dimensions can be described as having their own dimensions now <clears throat> now why should i choose a term which is used also in physics unless i want to bring in a certain kind of exactitude through uh, its connection through my exploitation of its connection with physics now as you know Uh, einstein's discovery of time as the fourth dimension changed everything and uh, uh, with the, the advent of uh, the theory of relativity the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity and so on everything changed and of course we are not uh, in the, the einsteinian world uh, also now we are in the post einsteinian world but anyway Einstein, it was. Uh, sorry, Einstein was who talked about time as a fourth dimension. So there are three dimensions already. Um, you uh, you think of length, breadth, and height or depth as the three dimensions, and then the, these three dimensions constitute cubicity, 
and then there is a fourth dimension which is time and you know the famous uh, formula e is equal to mc squared and all that <clears throat> but the four dimension space time universe has got point objects that is an object can be thought of as a point as a point but now people like kaluza and klein and people who have come after kaluza and klein are saying that there are not merely four dimensions that may be according to kaluza and klein there are 11 dimensions and after, according to certain other people there are even 22 or 28 dimensions so the dimensions they keep multiplying like uh, rabbits in a prestidigitator's hat see that is what uh, the big surprise is when you do physics and theoretical physics and particle physics and quantum physics and so on now when you think of a text as an object you are, we are operating in a four dimensional universe textual universe but when derrida says that there is no text there is only textuality and uh, there is nothing outside the text he has in mind probably the kaluza klein theory of the 11 dimensions and certain subsequent theories of more than 11 dimensions of course all this can be comprehended by us later on derrida doesn't make all this very clear you have to read cross check and find out the intertextual connections and so on but derrida doesn't make it very clear he says things in a cavalier fashion i mean maybe it looks like a cavalier fashion to me but you know, we need a lot more explication but we don't ever get the full explication and we always find being uh, ourselves being teased out of thought you know, even as any reader of the great poem of Cleatese would find himself uh, teased out of thought you know, the education earn is supposed to tease you out of thought theory and criticism understood properly literary studies understood properly as much as literature will keep us teased out of thought that means it doesn't mean it will they his literary studies will put us into a kind of a fool's paradise it doesn't mean that out of that doesn't mean thoughtlessness or in a thought free mood no not at all it will challenge you to think further and further and further and the horizon will keep receding as you try to advance to the horizon as they say in hermeneutics. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> dimension could be elaborated, but I'm not going to elaborate it. The point that I want to, the, what, uh, one point that I've already, uh, I think, made is that dimension is never measurable. One dimension is never measurable without uh, uh, your measuring or without you are coming into contact with other dimensions now that is one thing so you cannot have a kind of self-sufficient self-contained unitary approach to literature you cannot have a unidisciplinary approach to literary text because the text is itself is complex and very to go back to Eli modern life is complex and varied and text is therefore the modern poetry is also complex and varied but only derrida will say most texts are complex and varied whether well, the text worth bothering about are complex and varied or maybe with your complex and varied mind like derrida's you will be able to find uh, read, rediscover complexity and variety even in an ordinary text anyway <clears throat> you cannot have what is called a reductive strategy, a reductive strategy. We can have only a proportional strategy, and the distinction here between reductive approach or reductive strategy and proportional strategy has been formulated by Kenneth Burke. And when you think of one particular theme or one particular discipline as your true discipline and try to um, 
explicate the text and evaluate the text, interpret the text and evaluate the text, thematize a text or analyze a text, uh, even at other level, not only thematic level, even at other level, you are trying to put, fit, put the text or fit the text, fit would be a better word, fit the text into the framework of that one particular discipline. And that is what is called reductionism. Now that will never be rewarding. <clears throat> so what we require is a kind of interdisciplinarity. So rightly, David Lodge says that the theory is an interdisciplinary mix. It is not that you are given the choice of uh, choosing interdiscipline or monodiscipline. You cannot but operate except with an interdiscipline or transdiscipline for that matter. So <clears throat> this is the point that uh, you will be able to derive from the very idea of dimension. As you cannot measure any one dimension in isolation, you cannot pursue any one particular disciplinary approach or ideological approach to your text, any text uh, exclusively. Now, language itself makes it impossible for you because in language there are no univocal terms. There are no terms with just one particular signification or significance. Now, there is no such thing as the ideal technology or meta language. Even the terms in the meta language suffer from ambiguity, suffer from, <clears throat> if you consider that as a disadvantage, you, could, you would say suffer. Otherwise, you might say it is a, a, a real blessing in disguise because finally, that the language um, with all its ambiguity and polysemy, inbuilt polysemy, inbuilt ambiguity, uh, empowers us to deal with the text in all its complexity and variety and in a you know, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary manner. So, we have to adopt, we cannot but adopt a proportional, a polydisciplinary, poly perspective. Now, all this is trans. Uh, <clears throat> heavy uh, going already and I didn't mean to do this but anyway I got into this uh, somehow because I started uh, as usual with the definition of the terms in the caption. Now that is over. <clears throat> so there is enthusiasm on the part of the student or scholar and his in a inquiry, inquiry not inquiry, but inquiry, though the prefix yen is as uh, uh, inward looking as in for some reason, inquiry is also <clears throat> uh, a prefix which means uh, uh, something more than an, uh, a prefix like yen. In is also an intensifier, so an intense quiz, an intense inquiry would be an inquiry, a more inward looking and a more intense inquiry would be an inquiry. So the student's study or the scholar's study is characterized by enthusiasm and literature is to be dealt with all, in all those four significations at least and dimensions can be many and it depends upon our own systemic complexity, psychic complexity and variety, psychic and systemic variety, and so on. So that is my first point. Now, the second point that I would like to, second, uh, shall we say, uh, a pursuit, if you want, a pursuit, second uh, <clears throat> in God or snippet of information or uh, thought, uh, something like uh, what uh, Barth does in his analysis of a novel. He, you know, he cuts up the novel decoupage, that is cutting up the novel into various uh, lexias. Now, if you would cut up my speech, I would say that I have uh, taken care of one lexia in so far as that one uh, uh, point is concerned. So uh, we have taken care of uh, that uh, first part with regard to the definition of terms involving those three key terms. Now the second part, <clears throat> the second constitute to simplify matter. How do we look at theory and criticism? <clears throat> How do we look at theory and criticism? That's a question. Most people, or most of us, somehow 
we fall into this trap again and again. Most of us look at the theory as a set of propositions, as a series of tenets, as so many <clears throat> doctrines in a very general sense, as articles of faith. So to say. This is the propositional contentual approach to theory that, or to criticism that we always take. I think this is kind of uh, unavoidable in a classroom situation. So when you do Coleridge or Wordsworth or Shelley, you got all the critical texts right from uh, Sydney to F. R. Lewis in the critical texts edited by Enright and Sikharari. You got all those texts uh, in those two anthologies of David Lodge, 20th century literary criticism, first one, and then modern uh, anthology of modern uh, literary criticism and theory. That is the uh, second anthology by David Lodge. Now, when we do those essays, those, those excerpts or extracts found in these uh, uh, anthologies, or you might uh, be using <clears throat> uh, Robert Young's anti in the text anthology, whatever it is. Uh, now, any, any anthology that you have in mind, we always do these essays for our boys only from a propositional standpoint. This is what the critic said, this is what the theorist says, and so on. So, we reduce the text into so many propositions, into so many ideas, concepts, concepts. Uh, this is what is called the inescapable paraphrasing approach. And that, of course, is uh, a professional hazard. You know, as teachers, we cannot but uh, uh, run this uh, risk of uh, paraphrasing the text. Now, you can look at any theory or criticism not only as a set of proposals. I'm not saying you should not, that that's perhaps the preliminary uh, job that we have to do. But mostly we stop with that. So the second way of looking at theory or criticism is to look at theory or criticism, T or C. Now here after T or C, in short. <laughs> T or C <laughs> as a sort of attitude as a sort of attitude. See, you come across discussions of uh, postmodernism. Uh, what is postmodernism all about? It's postmodernism set of propositions. Now, you will find uh, postmodernism uh, is full of uh, self contradictions if you look at it proper, propositionally, if you look at it logically, as so many assertions, logical assertions, or affirmations and negations. Then what is it? If it is full of those contradictions and uh, mutual exclusions, mutually exclusive, exclusive proposition, what is it? Uh, some people say, you know, look at postmodernism as an attitude, not so much as a set of propositions. The same thing we could say about any T or any C. Now, you may not like a particular uh, idea. But yet, you may consider that as uh, giving rise to a tenable attitude, a tenable attitude. Or you might uh, think that as an attitude, which could be generated on the basis of the idea, could be used somehow in relative isolation from the idea itself. And thirdly, as a set of textual operations, you can look at the theory as a criticism, as a, any critical text is, any theoretical text is a set of operations at work. It has got linguistic uh, operations, stylistic operations, rhetorical operations, semiotic operations, philosophical activity, philosophical moves, ideological moves, and so on and so forth. In other words, we can look at T or C operationally, procedurally. How does the theorist or critic proceed from one idea? How does it? In other words, what I have in mind is something like 
the activities that, you know, that, that perhaps is a revealing title from Paul, the structuralist activity. The structuralist activity, I think by Barthes, is a marvelous essay and it tells you about the activity. What does the structuralist do? The question is not what the structuralist says or asserts, on stage, but rather what the structuralist performs. Uh, how the structures operate? Well, structures operate through setting up of oppositions, binary opposition. Structures operate by, by means of uh, generating analogies and homologies. The structures operate by means of generating totalization. Now, this is how the structure is, uh, the structure is operated by means of decoupage, uh, cutting up the text into bits and pieces according to his criteria. So, decoupage, binary opposition, de de differentiation, de -differ removal of binary opposition. Uh, the pre given oppositions are de differentiated and he sets up a new binary opposition, and so on and so on. These are the structural activities. So we can look at any theory or criticism as a set of operations, as a set of operations springing from a certain attitude without uh, any close link to the propositional contents of the theory of criticism. Now, whether this is possible to delink theory of criticism from its propositional content. Now, we can see that it is possible, that's what I believe, and what the results may be, they, they have to be gauged. Whether it's going to be the same kind of binary opposition as the structural binary opposition, the same kind of de-differentiation as the, see, Derrida demolishes binary opposition, but he sets up his own uh, binary oppositions. So his re-differentiation, his de-differentiation springs from a certain attitude. Of course, his attitude uh, is uh, <clears throat> at least tentatively grounded, is, is connected very closely with a certain um, proposition, with a certain, shall we say, proposition-less proposition. You know, he talks about aesthetic right thesis and all that. Now, uh, let, let me not get into too many complications here. So, you can look at T or C in T different ways. This is my second point. You can look at it as propositions, contents. And so you go about paraphrasing and we're done with the text. And you, you have undone the text. And you have undone your student. This is number one. Now, we cannot but undo our students, undo, our, undo the text that we teach like this within this institutional disciplinary frame because we have to finish so finish out so many texts, cover so much portion, we have to prepare them and we have to give them CAT and the, all that stuff. So we are kind of uh, <clears throat> driven, we are left with no option to do this kind of paraphrasing business with any critical text at the end. I understand that. But we have to take time off, at least after we have left the class, after we have done all the chores for the correspondent and the management, and the university uh, administration to think of theory and criticism as an attitude, as the matrix of an attitude, as a set of operations. This is my second constituent here. Now, here, there will be a difference in terms of what we acquire. We will not be acquiring from the text that is, as teachers and as learners, as students and uh, as a research guys, we will not be acquiring just what is called abstract knowledge, connaissance, as C.S. Lewis puts it. So C.S. Lewis it was who, uh, in whom I found this distinction. I forget the titles of these essays and the titles of these books. They are a long time back. I read all these things. So these things are floating about in my mind in suspension. <clears throat> So you can try to look up these references. So you know, C.S. Lewis, you might find this essay in some collected essays, uh, edition of C.S. Lewis. Connaissance, connaissance and savoir-faire. Connaissance is simply knowing. 
knowing per se. Knowing per se, knowledge without skill. You don't know what to do, can do with that knowledge. That is called a science. This is what happens at the end of our lecture, a brilliant lecture on a theory, on a critical school. The students will have some kind of abstract knowledge. If you do our job very well, this is what they get. They get some kind of knowledge, connaissance. But they will not be able to put that knowledge to use. In other words, that knowledge, as we put it in applied linguistics, they won't have any surrender value. They cannot surrender their knowledge, this abstract knowledge, somewhere and get the money's worth of value, the currency's worth of value. Goods. They don't have the surrender value. See, when you surrender a bill, that bill, you the currency, the state currency, you must be able to get things, buy commodities. You must be able to buy services or commodities. That is a surrender value. But you cannot use this knowledge, abstract knowledge. In other words, you will not be able to analyze a text. You will not be able to read a text the theoretically or critically or whatever. And this is a kind of knowledge that we are stuck with most of the time. And this knowledge keeps piling up. This is mostly information, information without inner form, as Lacan puts it, information. It has not formed you, your psyche, your inside. It has not formed your psyche. It has not reconstituted constituted your psyche. It is simply information. There is an explosion of information. There is explosion of knowledge. Yes, but there is no inner formation. There is no reconstitution of, constitution of the psyche through this uh, explosion of knowledge and information. So, savoir faire is knowing, doing. F-A-I-R-E. Savoir, S-A-V-O-I-R. These, all these are uh, as a French term. Savoir faire, knowing, doing. So you know, and at the same time, you can translate that knowledge into action. So what I urge here is a pragmatic imperative for all our literary studies. Of course, literary studies uh, in the main consist of theory, criticism, history, according to great René Villette and Austin Law, in the, the, that famous book, Theory of the Future. You can think of a uh, other kinds of uh, literary study. <clears throat> anyway, whether you are doing theory or criticism or history, T or C or H, we must have not connaissance, we must have savoir faire, knowing doing. Now, how are we going to achieve this savoir faire? How are we going to get our students? Acquire this savoir faire, graduate from this abstract knowledge called the connaissance to the level of savoir faire, surrendering which they would be able to enjoy um, <clears throat> analysis, enjoy being able to do analysis, interpretation, description, and whatnot, <clears throat> evaluation, and whatnot. So that is a big question here. So what are the procedures, theoretical procedures, critical procedures? Now I have mentioned some already. In the light of the structuralist activity, I mentioned some. Differentiation, redifferentiation, de-differentiation, homology construction, to uh, uh, totalism construction, and so on. Now, when you come to post-structuralism, the operations are one too many. We, we talk about desacralization, desedimentation, debordenment, deterritorialization. All those structural activities that you find at work in the, de the writings of Derrida. Now, I am not going to talk about any one of these, but I suppose, and <clears throat> I have given you some idea of what I have in mind when I talk about these procedures. Procedures. Now, as you proceed, you do things. Proceed. Here, the pragmatic imperative has to be clarified. Now, <clears throat> it's a little bit of theorizing here. Now, in fact, you use theory here and there, but our 
consideration prime consideration is practice or prime consideration is pragma that is uh, uh, praxis practice praxis <clears throat> so it was kant who made a distinction between being practical and being pragmatic as you know kant wrote those, uh, those three monumental works critique of pure reason critique of practical reason critique of judgment now he in the book entirely critique of pure, uh, practical reason yes he makes this uh, distinction between the practical and the pragmatic the practical depends upon the individual's will and action that's about all the individual can do it it is the option at the disposal of the individual it's a subjective option that's about it pragmatic means something more pragmatic means consequences a consideration the, the pragmatic is a consideration in relation to the consequences or results of action of the practical action i think they are interlinked and we need to couple them and practico pragmatic imperative practico pragmatic imperative and uh, that would be a kind of um, <clears throat> ad hoc tentative and uh, for the nonce uh, description of uh, the pragmatic imperative so it's not enough if we if our students if we or our students say this is what derrida says this is what foucault says this is what we must be able to operate as though we were an individual with a certain uh, with a certain foucault perspective an assimilated foucault perspective an individualized assimilated individual individualized foucault perspective you are not going to look through the spectacles of foucault or look through the eyes of derrida no it's going to be personalized in fact your own meta language is what is required at every point now as you as a speaker of any language is required is required to come up with the, the formation of your own idiolect your own personal variety of that uh, common language now yeah, when i speak english i have my own variety of english which is common to so many other groups so many other nations but it is finally my own idiolect that i am using of course this idiolect has got certain uh, essential and obligatory uh, rules in common with uh, uh, the common language the standard language called english so so there is this individualistic element about my use of english it can never be the same as somebody else's use likewise anybody's take on derrida anybody's take on foucault is is his own take it is not derrida per se and derrida would i think uh, um, uh, welcome that would only be with too happy about that because there it in principle say it's not possible to take over somebody it, it is not possible to interpret uh, uh, anybody um, <clears throat> much less me uh, if uh, per se uh, or without any distortion or without any uh, personal bias on your part so so we cannot but assimilate so assimilate theory assimilate criticism make it your own first internalize and then assimilate and what you internalize depends once again upon the pre given psychic apparatus that you bring to bear upon the text so all those things are uh, to be discussed perhaps uh, during the uh, question time but here this is what i mean so theory or criticism or history can be a set of propositions it can be um a complex of attitudes or it can be a, a set of operations a textual operations and we need to look at theory or criticism or history from these three angles normally we stop with 
paraphrasing the propositional contents of any theory or criticism of history. That is not uh, going to give us savoir faire, that is not going to give us surrender value. So we need to have what Aristotle calls chronesis, practical wisdom. So if you want, I would say that theory is a kind of criticism, is a kind of practical wisdom vis-a-vis -vis text, vis-a-vis -vis literary text, literature, vis-a-vis -vis text, discourses, science and what have you. So it's very important to think of the modalities in which we approach and approach, the modalities in which we evaluate a piece of criticism critically, the modalities in which we situate a critical system theoretically and so on. Or this, this, this you might say is a kind of meta theory and meta criticism. Yes, but the important thing is this is not meta theory as one more removed from theory. This is meta theory which will empower you for with practical wisdom, with savoir faire for textual operations, for adopting a yes, complex of attitudes towards the text and carrying out a set of uh, textual operations. So theory, criticism, and history is to be considered as a set of operations. As somebody said, I think it was in the portrait of the artist as a young man, that you find, uh, find this beautiful conversation between uh, between uh, <clears throat> Stephen Dedalus and uh, Peter Walsh. Peter Walsh uh, is Stephen Dedalus' classmate, yes. Uh, that, is, that is a text which I haven't revisited recently, so my memory is kind of uh, uh, vague, but I'm sure about this. That Joyce makes Stephen Dedalus, brings in the figure of Diogenes, the Greek philosopher. You know, the philosopher who went out with a lamp, with a lit lamp, looking for the genuine human being. And so, uh, Stephen Diddle brings, brings in this reference to Diogenes. And then uh, Peter Walsh, I think, says, well, Diogenes, you know, went about with the same lamp, looking for uh, the human being who did not exist. And uh, I think Stephen Diddle says something like this. Now, I will not be like Diogenes. Yes, I have a lamp, but if the lamp smokes, I am going to change it. I am going to get a, a different lamp, a new lamp, a better lamp. That is what you do with any theory. If the theory is a smoking lamp, then you discard it. And by the way, there is no Aladdin's lamp in theory. There is no Aladdin's lamp in criticism you will have to keep changing your lab. <laughs> and whatever lab you choose, I think, can only be lit with the inner light of your conceptual imagination. So finally, what happens is, you choose theory according to the theory which is already operative in you. And how forceful, how Puissant, to use uh, an Arnoldian expression, P-U-I-S-S-E-A-T, puissant, powerful, this inner light is, that is going to be the determining factor of the results when you um, face the text or when you deal with the text. So here, then my next point is conceptual imagination. This is what we require, conceptual imagination. This question about uh, literary competence was raised, I think, by Jonathan Culler. Literature as institutional literature, as a narr uh, narrative units, and the, those, those essays, I think in one of those essays, what, I think literature as institutional, he talks about literary competence taking over the terminology of uh, Noam Chomsky. As you know, Transformation of Generative Grammar, TGG, is based upon this crucial foundational distinction between competence and performance. And uh, Kaller takes over this terminology and he raises this question whether there is any such thing as a literary competence. 
literary competition. And the, the linked question is, the inseparably linked question is whether you can generate competence, literary competence in somebody who is not endowed with literary competence can be literally from his birth. Now, this question is raised in a, in a rather commonsensical fashion by René Weller when he raises this question, uh, whether it is possible to teach literature at all, teaching of literature, whether it is a feasible activity at all. Now, you cannot make somebody appreciate the text. You can simply go into ecstasies over a text, and the student can watch you go into ecstasies over the text. But finally, that student may he may get infected if he has the same wavelength, and the same wavelength means that the student has got something akin to your literary competence. Now, if he doesn't have the same wavelength, he doesn't have something of that literary competence which the teacher has. That's all. So, can you generate literary competence in somebody who doesn't already have it? Now, I don't think it is, it is feasible to generate, to create. To, I, we, we are not godlike. We cannot create a soul in somebody. We can only try to <clears throat> help somebody actualize his potential. We cannot put potentials into somebody's psyche. Now, whatever potential there are in somebody's psyche can be helped towards realization, towards actualization. So we can empower somebody, help somebody, enable somebody to actualize his potentials. But we cannot really teach literature in that sense. So color raises this question whether it is possible, is feasible. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, so it's not color. color talks about literary competence and he, does, he takes that for granted. Everybody uh, has literary competence somehow. Now, <clears throat> that's debatable, but uh, that is debated by Wellock and Wall. <clears throat> now, the point is literary competence cannot be inculcated. Literary competence can only be stimulated, can only be rekindled. It cannot be inculcated. <clears throat> so when we say that to be theoretically minded, to be critically minded, one must be endowed with conceptual imagination, a sort of scholastic intellectual intuition, intellectus intuitus, according to the medieval uh, Christian philosophers called the scholastics, intellectus intuitus. Now, in my own understanding, if you want to do post structuralism in particular, you need a lot of metaphysical weight. And you find that in super brilliant modalities in Derrida. So, conceptual imagination, scholastic intellectual intuition, metaphysical weight, in my own. Uh, uh, understanding, or in uh, Eliot's fashion, the comprehensive intelligence of Aristotle. This is the prerequisite. So everything that we do in the theory class or in the criticism class should be geared towards the stimulate, re-stimulation, rekindling of uh, this comprehensive intelligence this scholastic intellectual intuition, this conceptual imagination. Now, does that happen in the classroom? Does that happen uh, in our guidance? Now, for various reasons, that doesn't happen. And uh, I am not trying to uh, find fault with anybody. I think the system is more to blame than any individual for that matter. The system itself, that was why Frederick J J uh, J uh, Jameson said, uh, Frederick Jameson says, this is uh, a period char characterized by the waning of criticality and affectivity. It's a period characterized by the waning of criticality and affectivity. 
criticality in the activity. Now, you have to undertake a whole cultural uh, uh, analysis, wholesale cultural analysis to find out what has gone wrong with the education, so what has gone wrong with our society, why people are not critical minded, sufficiently critical minded, critical minded at all, or sufficiently critical minded, or why they are afraid of being critical minded, and so on and so forth. Now, you cannot give a critical mindset like a free vaccine. See, you cannot. You cannot give literary competence like free vaccine, for that matter. You cannot buy it anywhere. The soul should clap its hand and louder sing for every tatter in the mortal press, as uh, Yates puts it in Sailing to Byzantium. And I realize it now as I am growing older and older. So, uh, for every infirmity that I suffer from, my soul should clap its hands and louder sing for every tatter in my mortal dress, mortal coil. Now, that means it is the individual who has to regenerate. Of course, the cultural forces are against that kind of spiritual regeneration, particularly in this country. At this hour, we'll have to undertake a wholesale cultural analysis, a political analysis and a cultural We This is not the place. But let me say that's a kind of menticide attempted all the time, killing of the mind, being attempted, being perpetrated in a large number of cases. The menticide is increasing all the time at a particular uh, uh, historical, social, political conjuncture, such as uh, what we find ourselves uh, at right now. So, waning up, but somehow Jameson feels that it's going to come back, right? like the waxing of the moon is to be followed by the uh, waning of the moon, and the waning of the moon will be followed uh, um, you know, as part of the natural uh, rhythm by the waxing of the moon. No, they, now, I am not very happy about his, uh, <coughs> his uh, organic and natural uh, um, image of waning and waxing, waning of uh, criticality and effectivity. Now, this is very much like uh, E.L. Barrington's, uh, uh, Barrington, uh, description of the historical current, the historical current, and the Leonard John, uh, Leonard Trilling says, uh, there's something wrong with this image. It can, uh, history, history can never flow like that one way, or it can never be a stream or a river, a flow, water like that. History is a dialectic. Now, the waning of criticality and effectivity does take place all the time. And that is because theory and criticism are not taken seriously, except as paraphrasing exercises. Theory and criticism are not undertaken or not attempted sufficiently as a, a set of attitudes and a set of operations. Now, that is uh, a point that I have finished now. The next point that I would like to make of uh, Professor Murali Ghanam. Murali Ghanam? Hello? Sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you want me to proceed further? Now, if you allow you me, I will. <laughs> I will okay, I will take a, it's now. Another 15 minutes, sir. Okay, okay. Right. <clears throat> now, I have in mind theory and criticism as acts, as procedures as a set of operations, as acts. Um, one of my favorite poets is Wallace Stevens, and this is what he says of modern poetry. Poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice. Poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice. I don't think this is a description with the, which applies only to poetry. I think this applies as well to theory or criticism for that matter. 
to any intellectual activity, any niti, any activity of consciousness, what will suffice? But I will add that uh, I'm not quite uh, happy about the, uh, the criterion of sufficiency because logic also talks about the condition of necessity. First of all, there is a condition of necessity, the condition of sufficiency and the condition of expediency will come later. And I would uh, say that the condition of sufficiency and the condition of expediency have to be subordinated to the condition of necessity. As great Freud says, thinking must obey the inexorable goddess called Ananke. Mother necessity. It's not what I consider sufficient for my purposes, what I consider appropriate for my purposes, what I consider expedient in my uh, living situation, not what is sufficient, not what is appropriate, not what is expedient, but what is necessary in accordance with the reality principle. So, unless we posit the condition of necessity as a supreme condition. Our theory cannot but be subjective or even solipsistic. So theory is an act of the mind, act of conceptual imagination. Criticism is an act of the mind. And we need to submit to the textual necessity that was why at a very early stage, Derrida warned that deconstruction was never an individualistic activity, was never a volitional activity. It was necessarily dictated by the text. It was the result of the reader's submission to the textual operations at work in the text. It was the result, the consequence of what the reader finds in the text. The reader simply receives deconstruction from the text. The text deconstructs itself, as he put it uh, uh, sometimes. The text stands deconstruct, self-deconstructed. That is because it is a necessity which is operating in the text. The text cannot but deconstruct itself. And the reader discovers it, only discovers it, only finds it. He doesn't force deconstruction to take place. He simply <clears throat> finds himself on the scene of this, maneuvers to station himself on the scene of this, the, the, self, the, the textual self deconstruct. That's about all. So it is the condition of necessity, I guess, which I would consider as a supreme condition over and above the condition of sufficiency, the conditions of appropriacy or outchitya, and the condition of uh, experience. Act of the mind. And perhaps you are familiar with the two collections here of Derrida's writings. One is Acts of Literature by Derek uh, Attridge, the extracts and the translations of those extracts by Derek Attridge with the introduction and footnotes and so on, acts of literature. And then the, there is the other anthology, acts of uh, <clears throat> religion. Right now, I forget uh, the compilers. Uh, it's a collection of essays, I guess. <clears throat> acts of religion, including Derrida's essay, uh, <clears throat> in the limits of faith and reason or something, as a media said. <clears throat> now, acts of religion. Acts of literature, acts, I think is a crucial word there, particularly when Derrida uh, chooses to have his uh, writings included in books with those uh, uh, book titles. Because we know that Derrida had uh, uh, an extended uh, discussion. He, in fact, wrote the whole book. <clears throat> Signature event context in uh, uh, coming up with a wholesale critique of uh, J.L. Austin and uh, John Searle's uh, pragmatics. 
the speech act theory. So act is also a term used in the speech act theory. Now let us now disambiguate uh, and relish the, uh, the different meanings and significations of this term act. Now let us look at the act from the standpoint of uh, uh, the speech act. The act may be the act of the authorial intention. It is the intentional act. It is the act intended by the author of the speaker. That will be the locution of the act. The locution of the act. Then there is the illocution. I'm sorry. The locutionary act is the act uh, dependent upon language. And the illocutionary act is the act dependent upon the speaker. And the perlocutionary act, which is the act dependent upon the receiver or the listener or the reader, as a case may be. So you could discuss act in uh, reference to the speech act theory. You could discuss act with reference to Aristotle's distinction between act and potency. And in fact, Aristotle connects act as poesis because he talks about the creative aspect of intellect, which he calls nous. Nous is the, 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 the intellect, the Greek word for intellect and the mind. And that is also the uh, term used by um, Plato. Now, nous is poeticos, nous poeticos, that is the active intellect, and nous patheticos, that, the passive intellect. So, act is active, and act is also what stands in contradistinction from potency. Act is the realization of potency or potential. And in this context, we must remember that the scholastic philosophers developed this concept of act even with reference to God. And they came up with God as actus purus, pure activity, pure activity. Now, it is uh, very tempting for us to think of all this with uh, reference to the Panja Krithyangal of Lord Shiva. Uh, for that matter, any uh, deity that we may worship uh, in India uh, is credited with a number of uh, operations, with a number of acts, including the destruction is an act too, and destruction is part of deconstruction as well. So here is there is a lot of metaphysics, but I, I am not going into all those things in the here. But I want you to pay attention to this particular line in the wing hurl because it tags on to the scholastic view of God as actus purus. You know that famous line analyzed by uh, Jemson as uh, the seventh type of ambiguity. The seven types, uh, types of ambiguity. Uh, that's the book in which he discusses this particular line as an example of the seventh type of ambiguity. Brute, beauty, and valor, and act, oh yeah, pride, bloom. Yeah, and buckle and buckle of course is an example of the seventh type of ambiguity for uh, himself uh, we are not going into that uh, right now but i want you to take a note uh, um, of this particular uh, expression here brute beauty and valor and act valor of course is uh, connected with the french uh, meaning value that's a meaning it, it has got to, to do with courage you are daring and all that it is, it's also more than that is valor <clears throat> As Paul Rastia points out, that there are one too many um, gallicisms or gallicized English words, gallicized uh, lexical items in this whole uh, sonnet of uh, Windhauer, Paul Rastia. And this is pointed out by Jonathan Keller in his book, The Structuralist Poetics. So, brute beauty and valor and act. So, God is actus purus. Now, whatever be the meaning of pure, it cannot be discussed here. Whether we can have that kind of unconditioned act 
Now all our acts are compromised. They are conditioned. They are determined. They are over-determined acts. So our act of reading, our act of analysis is also determined. It is over-determined by <clears throat> cultural and um, political and social institutions, and also by whatever uh, uh, is there is inside us, uh, the unconscious, so to speak, the individual, the personal unconscious. So anyway. Theory as a set of operations can be theorized in terms of this key term act. And the lead has been given by these two key books, which uh, are anthologies of certain extracts uh, of Derrida's uh, writings, acts of literature and acts of religion. So I have been talking till now for the need, the necessity to adopt a practical, pragmatic, productivist, operationalist, instrumentalist conception of theory, criticism, or what have you. We need to train our students with working examples of theoretical operations and critical operations. And we must somehow find some space for Evaluation in these areas, evaluation in these areas in our examination system, in, in our assessment system, and so on. Unless we do that, our teaching of theory and criticism will peter out only as connaissance, which will never fructify itself in terms of savoir faire or prodigies. In other words, we need to do theory and criticism as a complex of attitudes, as a set of textual operations, rather than as paraphrasable proposition context. I think I will stop here. I don't know how much of what I said has really been made uh, <coughs> intelligible to you by uh, my terminology or by my mannerisms or whatever. And I am here to take your questions and I shall try to answer them to the extent uh, possible. Okay, so uh, now we'll be moving on to the question and answer session. Uh, the first question is posed by Mr. Benedict Paul and the question is, how can a scholar resist and overcome the Lacanian paternal gaze of approval or the Foucauldian panopticon, constant illusory surveillance in order to maintain authenticity or originality in critiquing or theorizing. Uh, will you please break it down into simple, I mean, uh, sentences for me? I am not able to deal with this. Okay, no. sir. Okay, so the question is, uh, what he's asked is, how can a scholar like resist the Lacanian or the Foucauldian principles in order to maintain the authenticity of criticizing oh, 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 or one, theorizing. One, one moment. How can the scholar resist the Lacanian hmm. principles and Foucauldian principles? Yes. Uh, hmm. just in one. order to maintain the authenticity or originality in uh, critiquing or theorizing. No, there is no such thing as unsupplemented uh, you know, originality or authenticity or individuality. See, even in the introduction, Professor Morali Ghanam said, you know, uh, I consider myself, that is me, I consider myself as uh, having been constituted and reconstituted by my teachers. We are being constituted. Well, I don't think we can have this. Is, I think this is a very interesting question because this has the Bertramian desire and the Rousseauistic desire of pure, unmediated, unconditioned self. Now, <laughs> I don't think this pure, unmediated, unconditioned, native, original self. I don't know um, whether we were born with that kind of uh, self at all, because we are uh, um, told even by uh, psychologists that we carry a lot of traces, the traces and the engrams. Engram is a term used by um, uh, uh, you. Uh, Carl Gustav Jung. Jung talks about engrams. Yeah. Engrams is the inscription in the mind. And uh, 
Derrida also talks about inscriptions and traces. Everybody in society is always already corrupt, is always already compromised. I don't think there is no uh, the way of escaping this simple fact. This is our existential condition, that we do not have a pure self, a native self, which I can call my own, unless, you know, <clears throat> I mean, uh, you believe in some kind of self-fabricated uh, myth about your own uh, pure origins. No, I don't think so. Uh, there's a lot of Wordsworthianism, there's a lot of Rousseauism, there's a lot of Bergsonianism here. Now, I don't believe that a self can be original, pure, and unconditioned. Now, the, the, the real thing that we have to worry about is not to take in anything without processing it with the help of our, with the help of our intellect and into all our being. Um, we, we need to process every influence. Now, Bloom himself, Harold Bloom himself says that uh, there is always this desire for the unconditioned mind, the desire for godlike mind, your own vice. Uh, uh, my soul dwelt apart. That's what uh, I think uh, uh, Verset said. My soul dwelt apart. Now, I don't think any soul can dwell apart like that because even when you dwell apart, and that is when you put yourself in, uh, in isolation, okay, your soul is there with all the, the pro tensions and the retentions. This is also the phenomenological quest for, for pure consciousness, pure unmediated consciousness. But Husserl himself says that uh, it's just uh, an exercise. It is an exercise by means of which you try to control rather than eliminate uh, the influences, the impressions which are pouring in, which are invading uh, the field of your consciousness. So there will always be protensions and retentions. Retentions are memory, protensions are expectations and desires. So we are caught between memory and desire, and so I don't uh, know why he is, the scholar is particularly worried about Foucault and Lacan. Lacan, I think, is very salutary, very healthy for me, and I think I would go all, almost all the hard with the Lacan. I, I don't uh, think, uh, for me, uh, Foucault is uh, kind of suspect, so I, I'd be more careful with uh, Foucault rather than with uh, Lacan. I mean, that's my personal choice. That's a very interesting question. Okay, sir. So the next question was asked by Mr. Selvin Vedamanikam. And the question is, if all the textual elements and textual operations go to form a decoupage, what is the glue that holds all disparate and complementary constituents? Would you say that again? If all the textual elements and textual operations go to form a decoupage, what to, is the go to form? Go, go to form? A decoupage. De decoupage. 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 Ah. Okay, so sorry for it. Deco okay, decoupage. What is the glue that holds all this apparent and complementary constituents? No, the, the constituents of the text. Uh, what is the glue? Which yeah. Holds, uh, now, yeah. the, the, the glue is, is the philosophical matrix, so the conceptual matrix, the worldview that uh, is operative in the text, that, that has been uh, um, enunciated or embodied in the text. That will be the glue. Have I answered your question? Yes. So can we move on to the next question, sir? Yeah. Okay. So the next question is by Mr. Naresh. Yeah. In lieu of the essential instability of the sign with respect to post-structuralism, how must we approach a literary text? Now you, you have to take, uh, um, uh, adapt your own viewpoint. No? If you are a post-structuralist enthusiast, well, you try to adopt a post structural stand 
if you are anti post structuralism then i think you should adopt that it's a matter of your choice uh, there are options and you have to uh, exercise your volition and you have to choose one of the options convert the option into your choice now i can, i cannot really say uh, you should do that or see i usually let my students uh, choose the uh, research topic and i also tell them to do, choose their methodology now somebody he may be interested in uh, history and there's no point in my trying to sell my pet uh, methodology which is a psychoanalysis my pet or uh, metaphysics for that matter uh, there is no point in my trying to sell that at a uh, uh, force it upon my student now you I, so i tell the students to i told the student now i don't tell any student i don't have any students now <laughs> uh, so i think it, it works that way it, it, the research guide i think must uh, really encourage the student to, to make this existential choice uh, to write uh, the thesis according to his uh, his uh, uh, intellectual uh, criteria his uh, criteria of scholarship okay sir can we move on to the next question sir oh sure okay so the next question is from mr benedict paul doesn't nietzsche's zarathustra surpass this human anxiety of influence no i my please remember that zarathustra is a fictive figure fictive figure anything can happen in a text that that uh, he may he may be represented uh, It, it has got to do with the Nietzsche's representation of Zarathustra, Zarathustra, and for that matter, I don't consider Nietzsche uh, very logical. Though a lot of uh, post-structuralists, uh, including Derrida, are very uh, supportive of certain aspects of uh, Nietzschean thought. Now, for me, Nietzsche is not uh, really desirable. I, you know. For various reasons, for one thing, Nietzsche is as is perhaps uh, uh, as nihilistic as Foucault. Now, I, the theory of criticism for me has a, a, a has have or has because they are one and the same. Finally, they are two faces or two uh, sides of the same coin. So, theory and criticism has uh, a moral responsibility, an ethical responsibility. towards uh, the community at large and towards uh, the individual as well and so i i don't think this anxiety of influence now he keeps repeating this that uh, man must be set apart the man is set apart but i don't think so now finally uh, nietzsche uh, accepted only one one value that was uh, the and that was the value which hugo himself has taken over from nietzsche self fashioning self fashioning now once again what kind of ideal self are going to possess if you want to fashion for the self if you want to generate a self or if you want to compose or constitute a self reconstitute a self now what is your idea of that uh, ideal self in the image and uh, likeness of which you are trying to restructure and uh, redesign your empirical your uh, currently existing self now i i don't think nietzsche answers any questions nietzsche uh, uh, zarathustra is uh, is rather poetic and uh, I, i think there's a lot of obscurantism about that i i don't buy that uh, nietzsche is not my uh, cup of tea nietzsche is not my cup of tea <clears throat> Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question is from Miss Hema. With endless possibilities of meanings, how do we guide students to avoid misinterpretation of a text? Now we cannot avoid a misinterpretation of a text unless we believe that every interpretation is some um, um, degree and manner. Um, Uh, away from the text, right? I mean, text per se is unknown. Text per se is uh, the noumenon. Uh, to put it in uh, Kantian uh, terminology, is an object uh, uh, 
uh, unknowable during the vida. It's an unknowable object that, that takes per se. There is no such thing as the interpretation. This is the right meaning superstition, as the new is pointed out. The right meaning superstition, the right interpretation. No. Now, at the same time, this is on the one hand, is a dogmatic only, a dogmatic critic will uh, come up with uh, his own interpretation and say, and call it uh, commensurate with the text. That the interpretation is always different from the text for the simple reason that the interpretation is written in a different uh, kind of language, it's a different kind of style. It's, uh, now, if you want to have uh, a totally faithful interpretation, then you should do what Eliot did. Uh, some uh, uh, critic or some uh, reporter went to Eliot and asked him, I don't quite figure out what you mean by this line in Ash Wednesday. Four leopards sat under the juniper tree laughing. He said, please uh, unpack this or interpret this. Tell me the meaning of it. And uh, Eliot quietly read back the line. Four leopards sat under the juniper tree laughing. This is what I mean. <laughs> that is to say that the meaning of the poem is the poem itself. And to have that meaning is to repeat the poem as it is. That's all. Unless you repeat, you and, and you cannot even construct a tautology. A tautology trying to is itself impossible because you are trying to recast the poem in your own words. Now, only if you duplicate the poem orally or read the poem back as it is there, you can avoid uh, tautology. But even there, I think, because of your uh, uh, style of uh, uh, reading, vocal reading, you will be changing the meaning and the drift of the text. So there is no such thing as the meaning or the interpretation as most, the, even the most uh, viable or the most uh, feasible interpretation of the text. As, uh, now at the same time, I. I am not saying that any interpretation holds good, holds water. I am not saying that also. That's why I said such a thing as critical humanism, critical pluralism. There is pluralism, but pluralism doesn't mean free for all and a kind of indiscriminate free for all uh, thing. No. There is uh, the great opportunity of every text opening itself up to every reader in a certain unique manner. At the same time, we cannot simply say that the text can mean this and that and the other thing or anything that I have in mind. Now, that is not uh, really uh, uh, amenable to rational discourse or rational discussion. <clears throat> yes? Uh, I think uh, Steffi has some connection issues, sir. I'll help you okay. with some of the other questions here. Okay. Um, this is from Dr. Tamil Mani. Okay. Um, okay. Sir, what would, you, what would be your prescription for pursuing an interesting literary study focusing on theory in the pre present context? Please. Shall I repeat that question, sir? Yeah, please. What would be your prescription for pursuing an interesting literary study focusing on theory in the present context? So it, it depends upon your uh, <laughs> uh, need. You know, some people would say environmental crisis in the age of environmental crisis, you cannot but have an eco literary interpretation of text. And some people would say it's a frivolous interpretation that we want because uh, the violence against women is on the increase and particularly in India and particularly uh, at this present uh, socio-political conjuncture. So we need to take feminism most seriously and promote feminism uh, as an interpretive option. <clears throat> uh, I mean, uh, another person who might say uh, ideology critique is uh, uh, the, 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 the indispensable option and so on. I mean, I, I really, now, uh, 
uh, as i said instead of trying to pursue any one uh, specific uh, approach uh, we may try to uh, adopt a proportional uh, approach or a kind of poly perspective approach uh, that depends upon how many of these uh, constituents the text uh, uh, touches upon uh, if the text only is silent about certain of these uh, issues then we cannot uh, talk about uh, the environmental issue in a text uh, which is silent about the environment or ideology issue or idea and so on so <clears throat> Uh, it depends on uh, uh, the uh, text itself, and uh, also upon your own priorities. If you are trying to promote a certain uh, way of uh, interpreting text and a certain thematic uh, uh, interpretation of that, uh, I think you could uh, use that uh, text as uh, the bearer of your. Uh, of your interpretation but uh, that is once again kind of uh, uh, fitting the text as i said into your framework now maybe you could uh, reinscribe uh, the text in your in your interpretive terms and uh, uh, keep uh, interposing certain cautionary remarks at uh, frequent intervals saying that there are other possibilities of looking at the text uh, um, so that the text doesn't have to be interpreted only along the lines of what your preferred interpretation in other words you are providing space for other interpretive options even while you are advancing your own interpretive methodology even when you are advancing your interpretation you don't proceed as a missionary you don't proceed as a, as a, shall we say as a as a, a militant ideologist but as somebody who cares for um pluralist uh, tolerance critical pluralist tolerance and so um uh, we could advance a particular way of uh, approaching a text we could uh, uh, promote a certain thematization of the text making space providing space for for other interpretive possibilities there yeah, something uh, Okay, sir. Next question. Can we move on to the next question, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. The next question is uh, from Mr. Muthu Kumar, and the question is: Intellectual intuition and conceptual imagination reminds me of Aristotle's conception of God as thought thinking itself, or Very Derrida's auto affection. Are you saying reading as a auto affection or self relation? Yeah, nous nocia. That was what Aristotle said. Thought to thinking itself. Nous nocia. That was Aristotle. This is a very subtle question. And I, I, I in the years, linked it up with the, the, the Derridian auto affection, self feeling. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that applies to God, and only auto affection need not be taken in, in a narcissistic sense. If that is what uh, you have in mind. now with reference to god we don't have to interpret we cannot interpret since i am an orthodox person in spite of my, as i said i have worked my way through post structuralism and i still have my vestigial convictions and values and therefore i i want to say that there is any uh, primal narcissism about god uh, being uh, described as uh, mind Our thought, thinking itself, knows no seers. That's what the uh, struggle is there. Yeah. Mm. 
Okay, so yeah. I mean, I mean, so, this, this is uh, what reminds me of uh, the representation of Lord Shiva sitting in meditation. What can Lord uh, Shiva meditate on? See, when he's sitting there uh, alone in the graveyard with uh, the sacred ash all over his uh, body, uh, what can he, with eyes closed, uh, in uh, absolute um, solitude, what can he meditate on? Certainly, he will be meditating on all of us, and on top of that, he'll be meditating on himself. Now, we cannot say that <laughs> there is anything um, like uh, narcissism here. I mean, this is perhaps the Indian image of pure theory, the Indian image of pure theory, and uh, absolute self awareness. Absolute self-awareness, absolute awareness of uh, uh, alterities and absolute self-awareness. Now, both are combined there. Awareness of uh, alterities, other things, and the awareness of self. So this is uh, the deity who represents for us, uh, or this icon, not the deity, this uh, icon of the deity, Deity represents for us, <clears throat> as uh, Derrida talked about the name of God, we have to talk about the icon of a certain uh, deity. So, this icon of Lord Shiva, I think, uh, uh, represents that kind of uh, awareness. But uh, I would like to now that is pure theory, but I would like to Lord Shiva doing things, you know, uh, and so I am. Kind of more drawn towards his uh, avatars and his actions of Panjakriti and so on, <laughs> rather than this act of uh, uh, self immersed meditation. Self immersed meditation. Self immersed meditation is an act, yes, but I prefer the other acts of Lord Shiva to this uh, act of uh, self meditative, this final uh, act of self meditative uh, immersion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, due to restricted time limits, we'll be taking up one last question. We apologize to those whose questions could not be taken within this webinar. So, so the final question is by Mr. Ilangovan Rajashekaran, and the question is: Is there a possibility to use the deconstruction theory of Derrida in research activities? Kindly explain. Deconstruction as a, as. A... Is that yeah? Is there a possibility to use the theory of Derrida and research activities? And he wants you to kindly explain it, sir. Sure. First of all, uh, <clears throat> we have to make a distinction between the grammatology and deconstruction. Usually, grammatology is considered theory, and deconstruction as the praxis of theory. This distinction itself has been phrased in traditional terms, that is, traditional metaphysical terms. Because Derrida himself doesn't subscribe to any such uh, uh, duality or even a distinction between theory and discussion. I mean, theory and uh, practice. So, between grammatology and reconstruction, according to Derrida, there is no uh, coherent distinction uh, feasible at all. The number one. <clears throat> number two. Now, this is not really the, what I'm saying is not directly linked with the, the, the question, but I'll take up this question at the end of these remarks. Number two, never consider deconstruction as an ism. It is not an ism. The people do talk about deconstructionism. If that is your stance, well and good. But you should not think of deconstruction unless you want to think of it as an ism, as a kind of ideology. If you want to think of it as an ideology. Feel free and think of it as deconstructionism. Otherwise, you must know that there is no such thing as deconstructionism, at least from the post-structural, from Derridean standpoint. There is no such thing. Because deconstruction is against all isms. Deconstruction is not a concept. It's not a concept. It is an anti-concept. It is a non-concept. It is, shall we say, to simplify things. It is pure rhetoric. It's a textual operation. It's pure rhetoric. It's neither a concept nor uh, an emotion. 
it's a neither uh, metaphysics nor nihilism it is pure rhetoric so keeping all these subtleties in mind let me now come in uh, let me come to your question <clears throat> Now, if you want to use deconstruction, uh, once again, use deconstruction. Derrida would say, no, you cannot use deconstruction. You must let deconstruction happen in the course of your reading. And you cannot force deconstruction. You cannot force deconstruction. You must uh, let it happen as and when you read the text. That's all. It is a process which takes place even as the atomic Fission is taking place in the universe. Atomic fission is taking place at uh, every moment in the universe, right? And so there is this deconstruction in the text taking place all the time. You must be able to uh, station yourself at a certain vantage point, and you can never be sure of that vantage point. But you have to try again and again to station yourself at a certain vantage point so that you can watch and witness this deconstruction coming into existence taking place under your eyes in and through the text that's about it so deconstruction happens deconstruction is never effective so you there's no question and again you will say you cannot instrumentalize deconstruction you cannot use it or even if you could use it in a certain way it would turn against you. It would be like uh, getting a hoist to the, with your own petard and to make use of uh, Shakespeareanism. Getting hoist with your own petard, that is, you try to shoot at somebody in the process, you kill yourself. So, if you deconstruct a text, you must know that the text is deconstructing you all the time. That is why a yeah, deconstruction is never complete without an account of self-deconstruction. That may look like self-contradiction. Deconstruct. Now, it, it doesn't ever take place like this. First, you de um, uh, deconstruct the text, and then you deconstruct your own deconstruction of the text. It doesn't happen like that. It's all uh, labyrinthine. It is all uh, cyclical. And so it goes on and on. Uh, in fact, I would say that I have not understood much of deconstruction even after 15 years of my plodding through the writings of Derrida. I will not be very sure about what Derrida is saying, and I am not very sure about what I have understood of Derrida. But reading Derrida is certainly an exhilarating, liberating experience. It makes me think that's about all. Now, whether this is feasible within the institutional context, it depends upon the time and depends upon the examiner. Make sure that your research student doesn't get into trouble with the examiner, the evaluator of the thesis. Have I answered your question? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for patiently answering all the questions. We have now come to the end of the session. I now request Dr. Nagaratika to propose the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, as Ms. Priyanka just mentioned, I'm Dr. Nagaradika, and I'm at faculty at the Department of MA English, DG Vaishnav College. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the talk today. I consider it an honor that the opportunity to propose the vote of thanks today on behalf of the Department of MA English, DG Vaishnav College fell upon me today. First, uh, we'd like to thank the Secretary of the College, Sri Ashok Kumar Mundra, and our principal, Dr. Santosh Babu, who have supported us through our endeavor. Now, what is a vote of thanks? The required formal expression of gratitude at the end of every official gathering that is very often ignored by the audience, that is probably rushing out to make arrangements to get home. But today in the digital space, due to the institutional demand for certain metrics, we have fallen into the unfortunate culture of clamoring to fill in the feedback forms to get one's certificates. However, today was refreshing. In that Dr. Noel's speech, we are very glad to note that not one request was made for the feedback form link before the end of the session. Personally, a first in my experience of attending webinars. This, sir, speaks volumes of the content of the speech and the competence of delivery. 
we want to have on record our deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Noel Joseph Iridayaraj Anthony Sami, who shared with us his scholarship today. The breadth of the subject matter that was covered right from the Latin litera to the structural operation of binaries to the Deridian anti-concept of deconstruction with an offhand ease stand testament to the years of scholarship underlying, underlying the talk today. Your talk today, I'm sure has, to use your term, sir, teased us out of our thought, helping both faculty and students alike to move from connaissance to savoir faire. Once again, sir, thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I really enjoyed myself. One of these days, and maybe after the pandemic is over, I would like to visit your college and interact with all of you in person, real uh, live uh, speech situation, unlike this, uh, this is a spectral context. Okay? <laughs> we, we'd really love that, sir. This is very much like Dead Poets Society conference. <laughs> you remember that? You remember that film? <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I, and I, I, I must thank Professor Murali Ghanam, you know, see, he, he really, uh, his ethereal music and the music of the spheres, Murali Ghanam, you know, Murali, he's Mukha Vasikim Kudanganan, I looked up to Kadarever Pillay in the Tamil Agaraji part, Murali of Dingra Sola part, Murali of Dingra Mukha Vasikim Kudanan Potan, the other from Dane Kudanan Potan. See, the, the nearest equivalent in English tradition, English literature, is the what and read of Lycidas, what and read. But you know, it is music. Is I think I, I am really very happy that he invited me. I, there are one or two dimensions I would like to mention. You know, he's a says Josephite, is a Josephite, but he didn't get stuck there in Saint Joseph's College. I did also get stuck in Saint Joseph's College, right? <clears throat> Um, so he moved out and I moved out. And secondly, he played ten he plays tennis and I, I, I was playing tennis too. As I said, this is a different surface. Uh, the ten, clay court player cannot really adjust to a synthetic surface or grass court. This is not grass court, this is synthetic surface. So there were certain problems of adjustment anyway. I, age is also a consideration. And, you people are young and so you uh, uh, adjust to this surface uh, very well. <clears throat> Anyway, I thank him. Murali Ganam was real uh, uh, Narada Ganam, uh, Gandharva Ganam, Deva Ganam. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Murali. And you allowed me, this Ravanam, to come up with my own Ravana Ganam about <laughs> theory and craft. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you here, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, um, uh, I uh, interrupted you. <laughs> and no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> I, I thought I would not be able to get an opportunity after you had finished your vote of thanks. So I had to cut in. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll just continue. Um, we'd like to thank the audience today, the August audience, whose overwhelming response has actually left us humbled. They have played their role of an engaged and cooperative ga gathering, keeping us motivated through the program. Our vote of thanks would be incomplete if we did not mention the HRM department who helped us with the technical know-how, allowing for the, I went to quote you, sir, technologically generated phantasmagoric webinar. So please permit me to be a little more optimistic, as even though seemingly spectral, it has enabled us to listen to you, which may or may not have been possible without this technological intervention. They say you don't thank your own, but I would not have performed my duty if I did not mention the following people. A webinar cannot be conducted overnight, and we are grateful to our colleagues. If it were not for the dedication of the two young faculty here today, Ms. Priyanka and Ms. Steffi Monica, who worked long hours under the able tutelage of our head, Dr. Murli Ganam, it would not have been the success that it was. And finally, sir, gratitude is due to our students, a wonderful group of human beings who keep us driven to deliver our best. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you, dear participants, for joining us today. 
we hope to see you all in another such occasion thank you thank you thank you very much